My name is George Brown, and I will be hosting this particular series, this Thursday series of Our Town programs for the next few weeks, and uh, I'm looking forward very much to coming into your homes and introducing some of the guests that will be occupying this empty chair. An empty chair I have this morning, and you're probably wondering why. Well, I decided that for the first program in my series, I would be talking to myself. Well, that doesn't sound too good. Uh, really time for the men with the white coats and the nets to come running in, but no, that's not quite that case. I'm going to reminisce today over my experiences during the period of my life which I have spent in southern Alberta. And incidentally, this goes back to about the year 1920 when I first arrived in Lethbridge. I felt that because I'm going to be speaking with people who have a story to tell about Lethbridge and Southern Alberta that I would like to illustrate to you that probably I am justified in hosting this particular program. Because this is a wonderful part of the country in which we live. I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Alberta itself is a very promising province, of course, as we all know. But Lethbridge in southern Alberta has a special appeal to me, and I'd like to tell you a little about it. For instance, right now, there's a special memory for me when I used to walk down the streets going to school. This was public school. And people were in the process of piling their leaves up on the curbs and burning them. In those days, we could do that. We were allowed to have open fires in the streets. But today, whenever I smell leaves burning, it automatically takes me right back to the days when I would be walking down 6th Avenue South from 15th Street on my way to school at, at Central. So as I say, it's strange how memories will occur because of something as simple as burning leaves. I arrived in Lethbridge, I was born in Calgary, and I arrived in Lethbridge with my parents back in, I think it was 1921. They were theater musicians, playing in the silent picture houses. And they came to Lethbridge from Calgary at the request of Mr. A. W. Shackelford, who still resides in our city, to play in his theaters here. And I think it was a wonderful move because I enjoyed being raised in Lethbridge. They first started playing in the pit, as we called it, in what was then the Colonial Theater, eventually to become the Palace, and finally it was renamed and rebuilt the Capitol. And I think most of you will remember now that the Capitol was demolished just a few years ago to make way for the Woodward Center. That seems so very long ago now, and I guess I became a real authority on motion pictures. Because remember, these were silent pictures. There was an orchestra in the pit, probably featuring oh, eight to ten pieces. There were no babysitters, I suppose, in those days, because as a young fellow, uh, four or five years of age, I sat every night in the front row of the theater watching the films. I guess I'm the only, only one in, in captivity, you might say, that has sat for years and watched every Tom Mix, Gene Autry, Hoot Gibson movie ever made and watched it twice every night. But it was fun. And when I got a little tired sitting in the front seat, I remember I would wander back to the doors of the theater where Mr. Shackelford would let me open the doors for the patrons as they were leaving. Or let me turn, you rem do you remember, they still have these ticket boxes at the doors, but not quite the same as the one I remember. It had a, a handle on it, a wheel, sort of like the the uh, 
the ship's wheel, you know, with all the big handles on it. And when you drop the tickets in the in the machine, you turn this big handle, and it would just automatically chew the tickets all up so that they couldn't be used again. And I used to just love to do that with these tickets. My father had an extensive music library down in the basement of the theater, which would be under the stage. And I can recall when a new movie came into the theater, he would have with it a cue sheet, very similar to what we use today in television. And the cue sheet would tell you the various sequences in the movie so that my father could match the music to the sequence. If it were a love scene, he would naturally have a ballad. If it were, as we know it, the old cowboy and Indian uh, adventure series, then the music would fit that. And I can recall going down with my father and so-called helping him to choose the music. And then once the music was chosen, it was played for the duration of that particular movie. And uh, when the movie changed, then the whole musical scene had to change. We, that's all gone now. As a matter of fact, although at the time I didn't really appreciate the tragedy of the Depression, I can remember some of it. And when the talking picture came to Lethbridge, of course my parents were thrown out of work, as were millions of other musicians across the country, across North America. And my father, who was basically at one time a carpenter, when he first came to this country, he worked for the CPR, and he was a self-taught musician. All he could turn to was his music, really. There was no demand for carpenters. And so he, in order to raise his family, he turned to teaching. And I can recall we lived in a house which still stands at 1504 6th Avenue South. And he would draw up a schedule. On Monday he would go out to Coaldale and on Tuesday he'd be in perhaps Tabor, Wednesday in Warner, Milk River. Then he'd cut across to the McGrath area. But on Friday and Saturday he was at home in Lethbridge in a room that he had converted from a bedroom to a, a studio and he would teach the Lethbridge students for an interminable long time. It seemed to me that I listened to that Jack Benny approach da, 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 all day long. I don't know how my mother put up with it, really. Especially when you consider that he was getting 25 cents for half an hour. My children don't believe me when I say that. 25 cents for half an hour. But he raised us, and he raised us well. But it's fun to go back and think about these days, you know. And after the teaching, it led to him setting up a music store. And although he didn't have much in the way of stock, he was able to supply the needs of his students with strings and violins and rosin for the bow and so forth. And that led to larger music stores. Thanks again to a person called Mr. A.W. Shackelford. My dad's first store was in the corner of what is now the Purity Dairy Building, which recently suffered a fire, but which in those days was the Majestic Theater, one of those grand old places of entertainment with the ornate curtains and the, the, the screens that went up and down on pulleys and all the advertisements on the screens. You wouldn't know that, perhaps. Oh, there'll be some of you in the audience who will remember the ads on the fire curtain. That's an interesting thing I'll come to, too. But that was our first music story, and that, that would be the east, eastern corner of the building as it now stands. And from there, my father expanded a bit, and put in records, and moved to larger premises uptown. Uh, the store then was located just across from the Bank of Montreal on 6th Street, where I think the gold and silver shop is, is at the moment. And then I'll tell you shortly when I return about another move. I, I want to lay this scene because I want to bring back a memory or two about the downtown area of Lethbridge as I remember it 
as a young boy. And I, I, I'm not really patting myself on the back, but I seem to be able to retain so many memories of those years. And as I say, I'm still going back now to the 1930s. As a matter of fact, at the end of the 1930s was when I finally decided what I wanted to do in life. 